Okay, we're going to move on now. We're going to be talking about uh, the best CPU of the year. And I think there's pretty much only one candidate because there's been some pretty lackluster releases this year. Uh, Ryzen 9000 came out and the non-X3D parts weren't particularly compelling against Ryzen 7000. Intel came out with um, the, the 285K and it's it, it wasn't great, which meant that all of the um, components less powerful than the uh, the 285k were even less compelling one product stood out i think this year for being absolutely phenomenal and uh, i bought one and it is the ryzen 9 9950x 3d which is essentially um the 9950x but with um the 3d cache attached just to one of the ccds this is pretty cool because what you're getting is i mean obviously it commands a price premium but (laughs) what you're getting is a, a cpu for everything right you're getting a cpu that's absolutely fantastic for productivity in fact in our benchmarks it was slightly faster than the non x3d cache version which is just terrific um but for gaming wise i mean there's been problems in the past with just one CCD getting the cache, but based on our benchmarks, um, the 9950X3D delivered um, pretty much the same performance as the 9800X3D. And certainly where it's not quite as fast, it's basically an irrelevant difference. So, you know, let's just quickly talk about some of the, the sort of benchmarks here. Um, compared to 9950X without the 3D, uh, Baldur's Gate 3, um, basically 48% faster than the non-X3D model. Um, these are our launch benchmarks, by the way. Um, uh, there may well have been improvements since then because Ryzen 9000 really didn't do great out the gate. But this is the picture as we saw it. Um, 32% faster than non-X3D, Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, 35% faster in Flight Simulator 2020. So that 3D cache, I mean, it does speak to kind of like the fact that uh, maybe games need to be more optimized for lower caches, mm-hmm. maybe. But when you don't have, well, when you do have that extra cache, rather, you are getting like huge increases in performance, um, relatively for a CPU, right? Um, the funny thing is, of course, that there are games that are better on Intel CPU wise than AMD, but because you've got this massive, like, increase in performance, um, it basically powers past what Intel is delivering. You know, sometimes the, the, the gaps are small, but basically to be the fastest in everything is quite an achievement. So, yeah. So, for example, uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, our custom run here, um, it's only 15% faster than the 4900K, right? Okay. Fair enough. Um, however, you know, you go to Baldur's Gate 3, which is faster on AMD, and suddenly you're looking at a 43% advantage over the 14900K there, which is like phenomenal. 32% faster in Flight Simulator 2020. So you've got this, it's an actual Halo product, right? I mean, there has been talk about adding a second 3D cache tile to the second CCD, but looking at these benchmarks, I don't understand what it would actually do. Yeah. <laughs> well, how it, how it would actually be any better. Um, and I just think that, you know, I would love to have been, and maybe this is something we should, we should, um, pitch to AMD. It's like at some point somebody said, Hey, you know, if we add this extra cash to our existing parts, we get this gigantic increase in gaming performance. And it is pretty much only gaming performance where you see it. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, I'd love to have, you know, speak to whoever came or whatever team came up with that idea and how they actualize this product because it's kind of niche, but it's just fantastic. Right, Alex? Yeah. It's basically changed our paradigm, I would say, on our PC testing because the high end PC, uh, you know, even with like when I was using the 12900K, I was impressed by performance, but I was still getting hang ups occasionally by. I still think bizarro e-core decisions and hyper-threading being less viable these days than it might have been in the past. And with the X3D products and the 9800X3D the most, and even this product even more so, is you just kind of don't get any of the downsides at all for all the high performance and money you're spending, you know, you're, you're getting just incredible performance across the board. Um, and it was a revitalization to the AM4 platform, I would say, where it really just gave it such longevity. Um, and it, for the AM5 platform, you know, you're getting all the nice PCIe uh, benefits, NVMe speed, but then you also get like best in class. Like there's pretty much the games, the games that run poor on the 9800X3D 
don't really exist, but those games that have issues, the 9800X3D is such a good processor that when the game has issues, I can just point at the game wholly and completely. I can't say there's some issue with our hardware anymore, or like I can't be like, oh, e-cores are the problem. You know, it's it's your game, man. Um, so I really like these processors, and I actually like the fact that now that there isn't a great difference uh, between the productivity workload and the, the gaming performance like we saw in the past on the AMD side uh, due to processes like this, and the, the fact that they're, they're scheduling in Windows has gotten so much better so that when you do load up a game, it is loading up the right half of the processor without issues. So I'd yep. say in general, uh, the X3D line has been incredible and it's really good to see it continuing to be a beast. Yeah, the, the final point I'd like to say about the 9950X3D and um, just fast CPUs in general. I mean, the paradigm typically has been in the past that you're, you should be always um, GPU bound and therefore your requirement for a fast cpu goes down right mm -hmm. that, that that's kind of should make sense it's certainly what happens in the consoles for the most part and that's kind of the way it should be the thing is though we're in the era now where you can buy you know as a matter of course 360 hertz upwards monitors so what's actually happening in games is that you're ping-ponging between being gpu bound and cpu bound depending on the situation and um you basically when you're cpu bound you kind of want best of the best performance and that's what xvd is doing um oliver thoughts yeah i think this is an interesting product because in my day-to-day -day use i'm very invested in the apple ecosystem and much less so yeah. on pc and obviously you can get pretty great experiences that are comparable very i mean very 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 similar with the 9800 x3d which is a, a good place to settle i think if you're more interested in gaming but this seems like a really good compromise point if you are interested in gaming but also need like video production workloads at least that's what it seems like to me looking at various content production tests here it seems like, you know, 9950X3D is about the best you can get in consumer hardware at the moment. And that's actually a really good space to be in, considering the fact that a lot of workloads don't scale that well with really high core, core count CPUs with the Threadrippers of this world. So this is actually a really good compromise point to pick. Um, in my own testing, I, look, I took a look at the uh, M3 Ultra, the Apple M3 Ultra versus the 9950X which is a very comparable processor in some ways and at least non-gaming workloads. And it does seem substantially faster than this, but obviously, you know, a 9950X 3D system is actually in the realm of reasonably priced, whereas perhaps the Apple product <laughs> is is substantially less so. Although in that case, you know, it's a different kind of form factor, different kind of computer. So I think this is just like, a, it's a good place to settle if like Rich, you're interested in gaming, but you also have these kind of creator workloads, content production workloads, things like this. It's a really great, no compromise experience to have. And then of course, if you're more interested in gaming, 9800X3D is going to do you just fine. So I think AMD has really positioned themselves super well by basically having the best gaming CPU, um, a really great productivity CPU, if not the best in many workloads, and just uh, just an all around hit it out of the park kind of product here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the only regret I have is that there's still, you know, the high end desktop segment has basically disappeared into the high end consumer sector. And certainly in terms of PCIe lanes, we kind of want more, right, yeah. Alex. Yeah, but, basically, you know, that, that yeah. is what it is. Our, our mm. workload requires sometimes multiple capture cards. <laughs> it, you know, even sometimes the idea of having multiple GPUs is also somewhat intriguing for different workloads um, or just multiple workloads at the same time, uh, depending on how many streams are going on. So that's the one thing that the, the PC consumer space, before you started get, getting into ridiculously wacko expensive enterprise solutions, I still think needs to be solved. So getting a ton of PCIe lanes would be great because as soon as you have a lot of boards and in general, they really want you to just have like one super high, fast NVMe. And as soon as you go above two, for example, then you start limiting everything you can do on your PC. You, most yes. boards don't even work with more than two really yeah. well. So uh, it's, the, it's the, the nature of the beast at the moment. Yeah, the concepts of plug and play doesn't really apply when you, you know, for example, you put in an NVMe drive and suddenly one of your PCIe slots <laughs> doesn't work anymore. That's just like doesn't quite compute, does it? it is, or you suddenly get like half the bandwidth and suddenly you can't capture 4K60 on your capture card anymore. Yep. That's kind of, you know, just all manner of hilarity uh, just from constrained PCIe <sighs> buses, the, uh, the amount of lanes there. 